One day when the power of evil is brought to an end, we will see the promise land. We will see the promise land. Hallelujah. We will be healing from this heartbreak. We've been feeling. Sing in the darkest night. Cause we know that the light will come. And we'll be healing. Hallelujah. There will be healing. Hallelujah. There will be healing. One day there'll be no more anger left in our eyes One day the color of our skin won't cause a divide yeah. One day we'll be family standing hand in hand And we will see the promise Good morning, Crossroad. Beautiful morning on Delmarva, is it not? This time of year, we we'll always have a little bit of low-lying fog and just keeps your attention going, you know, things like that. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you all, but I've got so many opportunities to donate. I get calls, 10 of them a day, I think, to donate to either politicians or charitable things or, or whatever. I've just had to draw the limit after a while. And I told the last one, I said, look, I'm only going to give to Christian organizations that feed the hungry. He said, like what? I said, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> They're Christian and they feed the hungry, don't they? Amen. That's right. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, you're an awesome God, and it's good to be in this your house, Father God, meeting, Father God, with fellow believers, people of like mind, Father God. And Lord, we just lift up our special praise team this morning, our special speaker this morning, that he will deliver the words that you've put on our heart specifically for this service, Father God. And Lord, may we be reminded continually, Father, the people in the South that are going through such devastation right now, people of our own congregations that are grieving, Father God, they're going through trials and tribulations of their own, Father. We lift them up in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, just take charge of this service as always. We'll give you honor and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is on fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning
Proverbs 18, 24 talks about a friend. That we must be friends. But there is a friend that is, sticks closer than a brother. Amen. Yeah. There is one friend that sticks closer than a brother. I got a friend. It's closer than a brother. And there is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. He is my strength. He is my portion. He's with me in the valley, with me in the fire. He's with me in the storm. Let all
been fighting him for so long. You've been afraid of his great mind. But you're finally worn out and you turn to see him. That's when you know it'll be all
last night we had a little bit of a laugh. I came out muscle memory. We typically sing three songs and, and we come out, I come out or someone will come out and invite prayer teams. Well, I came out early and everybody was waving their hands. They were saying, go, go back, go back. <laughs> I thought how awesome it is that we can be in the house of worship Amen. as a family and have a good laugh, right? Amen. Well, there's Amen. something else that we also like to do as a family, and that's pray. And so we're going to go ahead and ask that you be seated. And we're going to invite our prayer teams to come on up. And our prayer teams, they would like the opportunity, again, as a family, to pray alongside of you for whatever it is that the Lord has put in your heart this morning.
Lord God, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Lord, to worship you and to praise you, to give glory unto you, for truly you are worthy of it, God. God, we just want to know you better, God. We ask that you would just continue to strengthen our faith today, for without faith it is impossible to please you. God, let us remember that you are the cornerstone today. God, that you hold it all together and that we are not alone in this, God, that you stick closer than a brother. God, Holy Spirit, we just invite you, God, to continue to move in the midst of this service, Lord. We pray, God, for the word that's about to come forth. We pray God that you would bless the man of God that is going to minister this morning and we ask that Lord that we would not be just hearers of your word today but we will be doers of your word and it's in Jesus name we pray amen 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 somebody give the Lord praise in the house amen and we had an opportunity here when uh, Cokesbury had a had a need, and we've connected with them now for oh my dear, well I don't know, like like since two thousand nine, two thousand ten, something like that. And God's just you know we've had combined services before, and we've done certain things. It's just been a joy to link arms with the fellowship right across. The, we're not at, at odds with one another. We're working on the same team, and it's been a blessing to do these things and. Uh, so today, you know, I've had a lot of people come because Cokesbury's, like, next service, they would be meeting right over here. We've talked about that, and I've been able to go down there when I'm not having to sing and, and be able to sneak in there the other other week. A couple weeks ago, I, I snuck in, and there's Pastor Harold. He's coming halfway down the aisle. He's all excited and doing stuff, and he saw me. Uh oh, I better straighten up. The pastor's here. The, but he was just going to town, and I loved it. And the sad part was I had to leave so I could come preach here. I had to let it go, but uh, but I knew this service was coming where we were going to be combined and, and doing that. And and people have been asking me, so what's happening with Cokesbury? What's what's going on? And I in, in the last few weeks, I said, just wait. He's going to come and tell you himself in the service, and that's what's going to happen right now. Pastor Harold, Carmine, will you come on up here right now and... And he's going to share the message with us while he shares what God's doing at Cokesbury and what's going to be going on over there. He's been a tremendous brother. This It's been exciting oh, to walk with God amen. in this, right? Amen. Amen. And uh, amen. so I pray you get to hear that today. And when you're done, just call me back up. I will. I will. I will. Good morning, church. It's great to be in the, in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, you can tell a lot about a church and its worship. And this morning, is we were here and we were in worship. The presence of God is in this place. <clears throat> now, you can have the greatest worship team in the world. But if the congregation does not come prepared to usher in that presence, it's nothing. If you had a body of unbelievers in here this morning, Worship would be dead. And the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So God honors worship. And worship is so important because it sets the parameters for God's spirit to work in the word. So we've had the worship this morning. Amen. And the worship ushers in that presence of God. We know that God is always present. We know that but we have to usher in the spirit and allow that spirit to work in a service. And in order for that to happen, the people have to come prepared. My wife and I, every Sunday morning before we go to church, we pray for the service, but we pray for the people and the hearts of the people that are coming so that their minds and their heart may be prepared to come to hear what God has prepared for them. And we have done that this morning. So we know that God's presence is in here this morning. And God wants to work in his presence. And the title of the sermon that God has given me today is The Dwelling Place of God. And Pastor Rick, when he called me, he says, I, I really want you to tell him what's going on at Cokesbury. And I will. But it's like a cliffhanger. 
It's going to come at the end. So you got to endure about 45 minutes of scripture before we get to the cliffhanger. And I hope that I can keep it exciting. Well, I don't have to worry about that. that that's a wrong statement. Because you know what? God's word is alive. And when we're preaching the word of God to like-minded people, it becomes alive. Amen. So this morning, we're going to take a journey. We're going to take a journey through God's word and look at the places that God dwelled. And we're going to start in the Old Testament. And we're going to go to the New Testament of what it meant in the Old Testament to dwell in the place of God. And then how that transformed in the New Covenant. And then we're going to go a little deeper. We're going to look at how that dwelling place of God now affects Crossroad and Cokesbury together. The God of this universe, the God of all creation, the God who holds the palm of his hand, the world in the palm of his hand, is concerned about every little detail. And he's concerned about Crossroad, and he's concerned about Cokesbury because it's his people, and he never backs down from his people, and his people are faithful. So let's begin this morning in Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, and Jacob has a dream, and it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he, got it under, he put it under his heel and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, Jacob's ladder. And the top of it reached the heavens. And behold, the angels of God went ascending and, ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and to you and to your offspring, and all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to the land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. We all have a calling on our lives. We all have a calling on our lives, God says. And God says, I will not leave you until I fulfill that calling. Wow, what a faithful God, amen? What calling is on your life today? Where is God leading you? And you know, sometimes a lot of people come and ask me, what is the will of God for my life? The will of God for your life is to follow his path. And he will lead you in the direction of your calling. And you can be assured that if you, in your word, and you belong to a body of Christ, and you're in prayer, and you're in communing with God, and you're abiding in God, that he will lead your path, and you will fulfill your calling. And he will do, could come to do, just like he told Jacob, what he had promised to do. So just be in the word. Just follow God. I have found that what I thought the direction that God wanted me to go in is a completely different direction. I thought we had the church problem figured out. And you're going to see later, I don't have it figured out because things keep getting better and better and better. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever think or ask. Can I get an amen on that this morning? God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can think or ask. And I'm getting way off subject. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. Surely the Lord is in this place. There is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Let's set a little scenario here. Jacob's not in a building. He's in the wilderness. He's out in the creation. Not in a church, not in a, in a building with four walls in it. He's in the wilderness. And he said, God is in this place. 
God is so powerful, so mighty that he can show up anywhere. And he says, truly, this is the house of God. Wow. Wow. Jacob got a visitation from God. He got a visitation from a holy God. Did he deserve that visitation? No. Jacob wasn't a choir boy. Jacob was the brother of Esau. He was the second born. Even though they were twins, the scripture says that Esau came out first. So what did that mean? What's the significance of that? That meant that Esau was supposed to get the blessing because the firstborn always inherited the blessing. But Jacob disguised himself as Esau and went before his father Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is royalty in the family now and tricked his father into believing he was Esau and he got the birthright. He got the, the inheritance, the blessing that Esau was supposed to get. Esau wasn't a happy camper. They called Jacob the deceiver, a scoundrel. But yet God has a visitation with him as he's running from Esau. He's, as he's in his sin and he's running from Esau and he's trying to discover who he is and what his calling is on his life. Aren't you glad that our past doesn't depend on our calling and our visitation from God? That God will visit us no matter where we are if we commune with him. He says, seek me and you will find me. For some of you, no, for all of us, for all of us, God delivered us from the pits of hell because we were sinners headed in the wrong direction. Can I get an amen? We were, sin, we were, we were headed for a hell, but by his grace, by his grace, his Holy Spirit came upon us and we recognized that and received him as our savior. So here, Jacob has this visitation from God. So this morning, let's pray as we go through the scriptures and see how God dwells, where God dwells. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father God, we thank you for the worship. Lord, I thank you for this congregation who loves you who is so faithful to you. I thank you for the Pastor Rick of this church, Father God, who's been such a blessing, Lord. And you can tell by this congregation, the leadership that he has, the anointing that's upon him, and it's spread to this congregation, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just have your way in here this morning. Have your way this morning among your saints as I deliver this word, Father God. Lord, let this word be total by the Holy Spirit that indwells in me and none of my flesh, Father God. Lord, I pray right now that you just lead me, lead me in the direction that you wish to go and the people need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So we begin our story in Genesis. We're going from Genesis to Revelation. I hope you don't have dinner plans today. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> we begin our story in Genesis where God says, he says to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he says, let us, not God, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, he says, let us create man in our image. And he does that. God creates man in his image. He creates Adam and Eve. And they were without sin because they were walking naked in the garden. And they were without sin. And they were in perfect union with God. And then God, then we know the story that, <clears throat> that Adam and Eve sinned. Eve sinned. That's another sermon for a different day. Don't get mad with me, women, but we can preach that all day long. It's not the woman's fault. The man wasn't where he's supposed to be. So we can go on that scripture all day long too. <clears throat> but Adam and Eve sinned. So now they're not in fellowship with God. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we begin our story. And it says that I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Wow, was God in heaven wringing his hands like I created man in my image and now they have sinned? Oh, what do I do now? No, there's a scripture right there. God had a plan. And the second part of that scripture points to the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God will restore mankind and dwell among his people. And it will be through a savior. God will come down in the flesh that we're going to see and he will inherit the earth and he will leave us with the Holy Spirit and all who call upon his name will be saved and be as his family and he will dwell with them. So there's the scripture. So let's go through the scripture and look at what happened. So in Exodus 25 and 8, 
We're in the Old Testament now. This is Moses. And God speaks to Moses. And he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Make me, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. What is God talking about? He's talking about the temple. Now, the Israelites are in the wilderness, and they're traveling by day and resting at night. So they're on a journey. They're on a journey to a promise that God has given them. They're on a journey to a promised land. But yet, God wants to commune with his people. He wants to meet with his people. Now, who are his people? Only the Jews. Only the Israelites at that time were his people. The people that he had chosen to be his holy nation. And they're traveling, but they need a place to come and worship with God. So God tells Moses to build a sanctuary, to build a tabernacle. And there's specific instructions on how to build that tabernacle in God's word. What's the significance of that? Well, the significance is that God always has a dwelling place for his people. And here, only the the, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Why is this important? It, you'll see in a few minutes. Only the high priest had direct access to God because he would go in with an unblemished lamb and they'd sacrifice that lamb and he'd, he'd repent for all the sins of the people. Only the high priest had that authority. The other people had to wait outside. They didn't have a direct access to God yet. It was the way God set it up. So then we go to 2 Chronicles 6.18, and we see Solomon. And Solomon says, but will God indeed indwell with men on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven, the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you, much less this temple which I have built. Now they've built a temple in Jerusalem that God has instructed Solomon to build a temple. It's a beautiful temple. It's a place of worship. It's a place where God's people can come, but they still don't have direct access to God. It's just a dwelling place. It's a building. It's a a beautiful building, and that temple was destroyed. And then they built a second temple, and that second temple became destroyed. What's going on here? Is God's plan failing? Because every time he builds a temple, every time he builds a place of worship, thank you, Holy Spirit, for this. Every time he builds a place of worship, it's being destroyed. It's being destroyed. Do you know, I hate to say this, but some of our churches are being destroyed today. Some of our churches are being destroyed. The same as that temple was destroyed, some of our churches are being destroyed because they're afraid to preach the truth and the word of God. And the church is becoming like the culture. And that's what happened in these temples. The temple became like the culture, and the culture destroyed the temple. And that's what's happening in our churches today because pastors are afraid that their congregation will leave. Thank God we're not in a church like this this morning. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. But the culture destroyed the church. No, church. The culture does not come in to be like the church. Or I'm sorry, the culture does not come in to change the church like the culture. The culture comes in to be like the church. That's the difference. That's the difference. So now we go to John chapter 1, verse 14. It gets better. Are we having fun yet? Are we getting this? It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and beheld his glory. And the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we're getting somewhere. That God says, okay, this is my plan. It's, it's working. Just hold on. You know, the scripture says in, in, in Isaiah 6, 60, 22, it says, I, the Lord, will not hasten. I will make it happen in my appointed time. It will happen in God's time. God is sovereign. So now we're at a point in the new covenant where God himself, when he says, that he takes the form of a bondservant. 
And he becomes humble. And he comes down to earth. God himself comes to earth as the flesh. Think about that. Christmas is around the corner and we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And we just take it as another holiday. No, it's not just another holiday. The God of this universe, the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, stepped down into earth among his people that he created. Think about that. And he says he's full of grace and he's full of truth. Wow, two powerful words. Tension between those words. See, you can have a successful body of Christ. You can have a successful church if you learn the tension between grace and truth. What do I mean by that? That we have to speak the truth of what God's word says. And that offends people in today's society. God's word offended me when I got saved. But yet we also have to show the grace that goes along with sharing that truth. And the grace is getting something that we don't deserve. And there's a tension between it because if you give too much truth, well, you can't really give too much truth. But if you give the truth without telling people about the grace that comes with the truth, it becomes legalism. Oh, thank you, sister. But if you give too much grace without the truth, then your church starts to look like the world. Man, this is good preaching, man. I'm 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 going to buy this CD, man. I'm going to buy this CD myself. But seriously, man, you got to understand the relationship between grace and truth. And there's a balance and there's a tension. So this Lord, he comes down. He comes down as as the grace and the truth. It gets better. We go to John 14, 15 through 19. And it says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him for you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. Wow. Wow, we've come full circle. God has now sent the Holy Spirit, and he's a helper. Notice that the H is capitalized. He's part of the Trinity. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They're all equally important, but they have an order. Jesus could never do anything unless directed by the Father. The Holy Spirit can never do anything unless directed by Jesus and God. There's an order. So if anybody ever tells you that the Holy Spirit led you and it's against the word of God, run. Because that, my friend, is a false prophet. The Holy Spirit always, always has to line up with the word of God. There can be no differential. Somebody tells you, I got a word from the Lord. Ask them, show me the scripture, the chapter and the scripture. Now you can have a word from the Lord. The Lord has given me a word, but the word, the word that he has given me is in this scripture. And I have to go to this scripture to give that word. If I get up here and and I start telling you things that that aren't in this word and it's what my opinion, man, I hope you empty out of here. See, we've got to know our scripture and we've got to know this God of order that he dwells in. So now we have the Holy Spirit. We go to John 14, 25. One minute, stay right there a minute. I'm sorry, go back. It says, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And he dwells with you. (laughs) We started out with a tabernacle, a tent. And only certain people dwelled there, God's people. Then we go to a tabernacle, beautiful building, beautiful building, 
But the Holy Spirit, even though it's there, it was not indwelling. People were in the presence of God, and God dwelt there. But now not only does God dwell with us, he dwells in us. Did you get that? Not only does God dwell with us, he dwells in us. Why? Through the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John 14, 25, 26. These things I have spoken to you, that while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. How does the Holy Spirit teach through his word? If you're not in the word, you can't be taught what the Holy Spirit's doing. It goes back to knowing what the will of God is. You can't know. Show me the will of God. Ah, when was the last time you read your word? If you're in your word and you're communing with God, and John, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Salvation is a total work of God, but once we get that, we have to work on our sanctification. Sanctification is the process where we work with God to become more like God's character. We want to be that image. See, God has provided a way through Jesus Christ to restore us to the image of God, but we still have that flesh. And even though the power of sin has been defeated from us, every once in a while, that little flesh wants to raise its voice a little bit in us, huh? It's okay. It's just a little sin. It won't matter. Come on now. I'm preaching now. I'm starting to step on your toes, man. Praise God. Everything's been fluffy up to this point, huh? You have to commune with God. You have to be in the presence of God. You have to be in the place of God. Where is the place of God? place of God is you and him and your spirit. It's also the church. We're going to get to that in a minute. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Now we go. Wow, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? <clears throat> God in the old covenant used a building for his people to come and dwell with them. He now dwells in us, and we are his temple. We are his temple. Get this, church, that we are living in an age that God destined for us to be his temple. Think about that. Think about the privilege that we have as Christians to live in a time that God, The God of this universe, our God, our Savior, comes to live inside of us with the Holy Spirit. And we get to be his ambassadors. Paul says, in him I live and I have my being. So let me ask you, you're dwelling in the house of God this morning, but is God dwelling in your house? Is God dwelling in your temple? Is he dwelling in your household? Is he dwelling in your marriage? Is he dwelling in your finances? Is he dwelling in your career? Where is God dwelling? Is he just dwelling on Sunday? Do you just come to church on Sunday to get a little hallelujah and a little lift? No, that's not what we're about as Christians. I'm preaching to myself. I always tell our congregation, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching with you, man. Because I battle the same thing. I, I, I got a career as a real estate appraiser. Man, I can preach today. I'll preach on Sunday. To, by Tuesday, guys knows what I'm saying to somebody. Don't laugh. You're doing the same thing, man. Come on. Come on. You ain't saints out there. I know we battle the flesh. Come on now. Look at that. Oh, look at that pastor. He preached on Sunday. They said he's going to go out there on Tuesday. And know what? You're doing the same thing. Because we battle. It's a spiritual battle that we're in, folks. It's a spiritual battle that we're in. So why do we go through that? Why do we go through from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Because I always like to show when we go through Scripture what the application is. 
What can I leave here today with those scriptures that that Holy Spirit dwells in me? What can I take from that? Look at the world that we're in. It's a spiritual battle. It's not two parties. It's good and it's evil. It's good and it's evil. The devil is like a roaring lion. He comes to seek, kill, and destroy. That's the one side. But God says, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly. But you know what? The God of this universe and his plan has decided to send a Savior, Jesus Christ, and implant the Holy Spirit in us, give us the Holy Spirit so that we may reflect him. So we live in a world that is contrary to who we are. Your pastor talked about your identity. Your identity is in Christ. That's who you are if you're a born-again Christian. It's not in your career. It's not in your name. You have a name, yes, but your identity is Christ. In everything you do, your identity is in Jesus Christ. Think about that. Everything we do, our identity is in Jesus Christ. So when the world says that a woman has a right to choose because it's her body, God says in Psalm 139 that I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. That when we go and try and kill babies and say it's okay to kill babies, no, nearly <coughs> on the old adage, birth starts at conception. No, it doesn't. What? That's silence there, isn't it? Think about that. Birth does not start at conception. Oh, so it's okay to go ahead and kill a baby? No, listen to the scripture. The scripture says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Through the sovereignty of God, before the sovereignty, because of the sovereignty of God, God knew who you were before your parents were even born, before you were even conceived. God decided that. Not your mom, not your dad. Oh, you're getting it now. Come on. At least this front row's getting it, man. Come on. So somebody t comes up to you and says, Oh, I think abortion's okay. It's my body. I have a right to choose. Not according to Psalm 139, not according to God's word. <clears throat> Give them that scripture. <clears throat> Gender identity. <laughs> a 10 or 12-year-old has a right to decide who they are. I mean, you tell me that's not of the devil. Amen. God created you. He decided you. Amen, perfectly. You're, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, his scripture says. I've had people who <clears throat> struggle with their gender identity. Come, I give them that scripture. Read what God says about you. See, that's it. The devil wants us to think that we're not who God tells us we are. He wants us to think that he can control us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But we were bought and paid for by a price. So we have to, we have to know the word of God. Marriage, same-sex marriage. God designed marriage between a man and a woman. Don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger. You got a problem with it? Go to the word. Tell God to take the pages out. You know, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I wish there was some scripture in the Bible that they could take out. Is there anybody here that's like that? Amen. I mean, really? Come on, man. I'm not pleased with everything God has me to do and tells me that I've got to do. Like, love my wife all the time? Come on, give me a break. Come on, man. <clears throat> What's really bad, I love her. What really she's got to put up with, that the scripture says the same about her, that she's got to love me. Trust me, I give her some times when she shouldn't love me. Come on, man. Say an amen in there. Are we having fun tonight? Isn't it great to be in the place of the Lord and let God work and we can learn God's word? Praise him for that. Praise him for that. Luke 12, 32, 34, my last scripture. Then we'll start the sermon. Do not fear, little flock, for it is Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not fear, little flock, for it is God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. <clears throat> it says, sell 
Therefore, what you have and give alms, provide yourselves money bags, which do not grow old, a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Do you see that scripture? God has given us the keys to the kingdom. He is so powerful. And you got to get this. You got to get this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God is so powerful that he doesn't trust our flesh. He doesn't trust our old self. No, he trusts his power through his Holy Spirit. Think about this. That God gives us the keys to the kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean we do what we think. We have to operate under the authority of God and operate according to the Holy Spirit. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? We have to operate under the power of the Holy Spirit. But God knows that his Holy Spirit, because that's him, Come on now, we're talking about the Trinity because that Holy Spirit is him that he has trusted us with his kingdom. That's how powerful our God is. When we are weak, he is strong. So when we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. People misle- misconstrue that scripture. That doesn't mean that I can go out here and run a marathon tomorrow and say, God, I'm going out here and run a marathon because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm 72 years old. My knees hurt. Now, I have run a marathon. Okay, I have run a marathon, but I was about 100 pounds lighter and I was about 50 years younger. Okay, so praise God. <clears throat> No, that means we can only do what God has called us to do. If it's ordained by God, if it's our calling, if it's, if, it, if it's what we can do, if it's according to God's word, he gives us the power to do that. Amen. So we have this gift now of the Holy Spirit. That's universal. We are God's church. Okay, now the scripture clearly says, <clears throat> that God operates not in buildings made by hand, but in his spirit. We know that. But God has given us buildings. He gives us the church. The church is not the building. The church is the body of Christ. But God clearly calls that body to come together. He says, do not forsake the assemblage of the saints in Hebrews. Are you with me? So now we have the Holy Spirit. We are God's kingdom, but God has designed buildings, which he calls the church building, for his church to come to. When we came into this building this morning, you know, pastor, <clears throat> pastor says, well, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Yes, it is. And the Spirit can dwell in here, but when we leave, the Spirit can dwell, but we bring in the Spirit. So that is the house of God, but God has designed this building for crossroad to meet. So let's go in the cliffhanger park. Can you show our church, please? <clears throat> this is our church at Cokesbury. It's the place where God has designed for Cokesbury Worship Center to come and to worship for over 200 years. Church is 165 years old, that building. 165. Next slide, please. On January the 21st, on a Sunday night, I get a call that the church had been run into. You see that little tile out there on that side? That's on the Bridgeville side of the church. A car jumped that ditch at a high rate of speed and ran into the church. And I go down and I see it, and it's like no big deal. Little patch. We can have that, and we'll be back here by next Sunday. Next slide, please. This is the other wall on the other side of the church. Not the side that the church hit, that the car hit, but the other side. It split that wall. You can see the outside from that crack right there. The county comes and condemns the church. We can't meet now. But I called Pastor Rick, not just called him because I know, I know he's always going to be there. In times like this, because he's proven himself for that. 
And he comes down and he says, don't worry. He says, we got a place for you. Next slide, please. And that place is Crossroad Church. Praise God for that. We did not miss one Sunday. Next slide, please. That's our church. That's where God decided that Cokesbury Worship Center was going to meet for the next nine months. Nine months? Like, what kind of builder you got? Can't get your church done in nine months. Well, it wasn't a builder. It was God delayed it. And why? I don't know. But we had so much trouble with the insurance company. They were going to get us $70,000 to repair that church. We had four different builders, engineers, people with knowledge in the business look at it and said, the only choice you got is to tear this building down. And we got $70,000. We got a place to worship. God will provide that. It, isn't it funny how God will provide the details and he won't show you the big picture, but he's got, you got to trust him to walk through the details. That, that's for somebody in here this morning. Amen. You're going through something, and you're not, you can't see where it's going, but God's just showing you little bits and little pieces. <clears throat> My faith wavered. Like, God, what, what? You want us to be here? What, what, what? We don't have a church. Why won't you give us the money to have the church? And one thing led to another. And I'm happy to report this morning that we have come to a settlement with our insurance, and they are going to give us money to rebuild Cokesbury Worship Center. <clears throat> God provided. He provided. But the story's not over. There's more coming that I know that you don't know. And I don't even attend this church. And we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> but maybe you're going through something this morning. And you're not, your faith is wavering. I'm here to tell you that we serve a God <clears throat> who will show you the way. If you just trust him. If you just trust him. Some things have happened. God says, I'll give you exceedingly more abundantly than what you think of ask. It's a new season for Cokesbury. I know it. Since we've came here, we came with 40 people. We had 70 people last week in the Jericho room. <clears throat> I started thinking last night, we had, we had dinner with, with Pastor Rick after the service, and I just started thinking about the way God's designing things and leading them up. He wants to grow us here before we move. He wants us to be under godly people. Not that we're not a godly church, but he wants us to commune with godly people. And he wants to dwell among us as a body. Man, the power. I call it the Cokesbury Beltway. People go by here in the summer and they're getting saved and they don't even know how they're getting saved going to the beach. <laughs> they're going east to the beach. And they come by here on a Sunday morning and they hear Pastor Rick preaching the anointing and the Holy Spirit and something hits them by the time they get to Cokesbury and I or Pastor Gene are preaching, it's all over for them. <laughs> but... By the time they get to Georgetown, man, they're pulled over, down on their knees. Jesus Christ, I accept you as Lord and Savior. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. You think I'm kidding. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. I know it's happened. I know it's happening because I know how powerful our God is. I know how powerful our God is. I want to close with Matthew 11, 11 this morning. Before I go there, I do want to thank <clears throat> you as a body of Christ. You've just been so good to us. You've welcomed us with open arms. <clears throat> and as my wife says, there's no way we can repay you. Well, there is. There is. Together, 
together as a body of Christ, we can be about our Father's business. And we can defeat the devil, not on our power, but the power of God. Last scripture. Surely I say to you, among these born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist was a prophet. Although he's in Matthew, he's actually part of the Old Testament because Jesus had not come yet. He paved the way for Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, Jesus says in his word that there was not one risen that was greater than John the Baptist. Not one. But look at this. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know who that is? That's us. That's us. We are the least in the kingdom. But God has called us the greatest. Why? Because of who we are. Because of our identity. Because God has appointed us into his kingdom. And we have chosen to be in his kingdom. And we're part of him. Think about that, church. Gosh, I don't want to stop preaching because I love the presence of God that's in this place. But you know what? We got to take that presence out. It's great. The devil's happy. He knows he's lost us. He, he, he's not real concerned about us meeting. He knows that. But the devil gets really wary when we take that out and we start sharing that gospel of Jesus Christ to that broken world. But you know what? <clears throat> The scripture says, and i got to wrap up. The scripture says, where there's darkness, there's light. And the light is always greater than the darkness. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to be in God's kingdom. What do I got to do to be in God's kingdom? The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. Believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. It's by faith. It's simple faith. It's a simple trust in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Bible says that the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. No other way to heaven. No other way to be in God's kingdom. And you don't, you're not part of God's kingdom today. You can do that this morning. By simply, if the Holy Spirit has touched you this morning, just by faith, faith believing that and confessing that with your mouth. If there's anyone like that here this morning, would you just raise your hand? Anyone in here this morning? Anyone? Is that a hand back there? I can't see. Any hands? Any hands going up? But praise God. We had a salvation last night. Last night, there was a, a woman who the Holy Spirit touched, and she entered the kingdom of God. And I'm done, and I'm tired, <laughs> and I'm hungry, and I want to sit down. But Pastor Rick won't let me sit down. He's asked me to call him up here. As he comes up, <clears throat> um, Gene and Sandy Pryor have left. That's our pastor, our, wor- or our, co- our associate pastor, and our worship leader. And they have been with us. I know what's going to happen now. You don't, but I do. <clears throat> uh, get your Kleenexes out. Um, <clears throat> and they have been instrumental in this walk. But um, I would like my, ask my wife to come up. Right now, please. Because this journey's hard. But she's as much a part of this ministry as I am. Because she's my rock. She's my support. We've wanted to quit. I've wanted to quit a hundred times. She's probably not wanting to quit that much, but when I want to, she's always there saying, no, you're called by God. And I praise her and I thank her for sending, I thank God for sending me a woman of God that will support me. Well, I just want to say I'm so glad to be in this kingdom of God. Amen. To be able to walk with you and, and, and what is happening Nine months ago, we didn't know what was what was going on. Uh, I got the phone call. He told me I, I, about the car. He said, "I just want you to pray. That's all I want." And and, and we hung up. And I was sitting there beside my wife, Gail, 
And and I told her, wow, the church just got run into down there at Cokesbury. And she looked right at me. She says, well, you're going, aren't you? <laughs> I, was, I love it when you can have the same mindset together. And, and, and I got in the car and I started riding. And, and I told her, I told Gail, I said, well, yeah, I should because we really ought to, whatever they need, we ought to be able to offer it. So I got in the car and I started riding down and I called Carrie our administrator. I say, Carrie, this is what happens. And, and I'm going to offer from Jericho, the, the, the room in the education. I said, is there any, anything I don't know? Cause she keeps track of all the buildings. Anything I don't know. Can we do this? And she said, yeah, yeah. And I found out last night, we went to dinner last night and they told me that Gene and his wife knew all about it before, Amen. Before I got there, because Carrie called Kara, and Kara called them, and they had the news that we were going to do it, I think, before I even announced it to them. But I, I go down there, I see the building, and I said, don't worry, guys, we got a room for you. We got a room for you. When they came into that room nine months ago, they were about 40 people. Amen. Amen. They were about 40 people. I think you said last week you had 77. 70 people. 70 people. Praise God. There's an anointing on this place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's just, it, it's eye-opening, I think, for them to, to see God's plan unfold in front of their eyes. Because how they were thinking nine months ago is not how they're thinking now. Amen. Where they were in the kingdom nine months ago is not where they are in the kingdom of God. You would say, oh, my dear, you lost your building. You haven't been in there. Something bad's going to happen. No, something good's been happening. Man. And it's been amazing. Well, last night I, I asked uh, Pastor Harold, I said, stand here and, and look this way. So you can, you can join him this time. And I said, I want to read something to you. On Tuesday, October 8th, the Crossroad Community Church Board voted unanimously to pledge, are you guys ready for this? $50,000 to the Cokesbury Worship Center Rebuilding Project. To God be the glory. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, this is what the kingdom's about. This is about what the ki this is about what the kingdom is about. Our project manager was to the first service this morning, and I said, "Scrap those plans. We're back to what God wants." So please keep us in prayer for that, as God leads us what to build and how to build. But we're believing for increase, increase in this area. It's 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 the Cokesbury Beltway, I call it. <laughs> that that you come by here. Driving to the beach, and you're going to get saved because the power of God is so, so powerful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We had a standing ovation in the last service, too. I think we had about 800 people say yes. Agree that this is what God's doing, and uh, grateful to the board for their heart. And uh, just good to be a part of this. Okay, next week. It's going to be a great service, too. Next week is the harvest offering. And uh, this, you know, you come here and we, we talk about the Lord and, and all that. We rarely speak about money. We do the ministry and money follows the ministry. And uh, it's been a blessing, the giving, that we could do something like this. But next week, we ask every single one of you to be praying to God, to be able to say, what? What do I do to be a part of this? What do I do to be a part of this heart? What, what do I do to what God is doing to touch this whole area? 
you know, two days from now, we're going to have over 100 pastors in the 5 to 10 service. We're going to be encouraging over 100 pastors. We're going to be pouring into their lives. We're going to be blessing them. And it's because of the heart of, of what God is doing here in the people. And so next week's offering, everything that's given over uh, in the services and online will go into the, the growth fund for the, what God is doing, for the vision of what, what is happening here. We're, we're going over plans for Dagsboro to be able to, to, to more than double and triple the size of down there. And uh, we're helping Cokesbury to be able to we're help, uh, at least double the size there and just to be a part of these things. So you pray, you ask. Here, here's what I'm believing for, that we simply just gave a tithe to Cokesbury with what God's going to do in our harvest offering. But whatever God does, I'm going to just be rejoicing that we're doing it together and we're celebrating together. Also, as you exit today, the Christmas boxes are there. Last year, I think we broke the record on how many we did. And some of you probably don't know this, but we've actually had services where people were here who received these boxes in the foreign lands. I remember w one year we had a, a black lady here who had a like a turban type thing. And we were talking about it and she just stopped. She said, could I say, and I said, yeah. She said, I was in Africa in my village, and I received one of those boxes. It changed my family's life, and she was right here in our service as we're collecting these boxes. So be a part of that. Grab one of those boxes, fill it, bring it back, and our wonderful volunteers, David and Sheila, and, and just the different ones that are helping them have been doing marvelous with this, that ministry. So be a part of that. Other than that, you know what we got. Seven days, so let's not waste them. Let's be the lights that we're called to be. Know who we are. We take the temple of God everywhere we go because God's living right here. Let's, let's let him shine. Well, Lord, I thank you for the body of Christ that's here. I thank you for what we've been able to do with Cokesbury today. We bless them, Lord. We bless them. Just like Moses needed someone to lift up his hands, Aaron and her came alongside so they could finish the mission that you had. Well, Lord, we're lifting up Cokesbury's arms so they can finish the call and mission you've got for them. And, and so bless them. And Lord, each one of us that are here, may we really understand who we are in you and may we go out ready to serve, filled with your presence. May you touch people all over Del Marva. And may we come back with a testimony on our lips of the goodness of God. And, and we'll just uh, give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said.